events. So hello, everyone. Good morning from Vienna, and welcome to our pre-IGF events, protecting the public core of the internet from formulation to implementation. My name is Alexander Klimberg from the Hague Center for Strategic Studies, and I'm the director of the Global Commission on Stability for Cyberspace. And I'll be the moderator for today's session, which we hope will unfold in three phases. First, there will be a briefing from members of the GCSS, GCSC, recapping both our report, Advancing Cyber Stability, and introducing, of course, our norm, the protecting the public core of the internet. Secondly, we are joined by some external commentators from uh, government, business, civil society, and the technical community. And uh, we look forward to hearing their views on the public core norm. And finally, if time permits, I would hope for a brief uh, question and answer session and online commentary. If you would like to ask questions to the panelists, please use the friendly Q&A button in the center of the Zoom application. And please introduce yourself also on the Zoom webinar chat. We had a very lively discussion yesterday during the GCSC session, and I hope we can replicate that today. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce the briefers of the GCSC on the, brief, on the GCSC side. Um, first of all, we'll be having a video by Vince Cerf. Uh, it's about um, three o'clock in the morning where he is. So he has asked permission, or was gladly granted, uh, to provide a video introduction on the public core, which we'll be playing first. Vint, of course, needs no introduction himself. He is vice president and chief internet evangelist at Google, as well, of course, as one of the founding fathers of DNS. Um, then we would we were planning on going to Dr. Samir Saran, president of the Observer Research Foundation and chair of the Sci-Fi Conference Series. Unfortunately, Samir has had a, a illness in the family that he needs to attend to, so he won't be joining us. So his part of the session will be covered by the next speaker, uh, Professor Wolfgang Kleinwächter, Professor Emeritus University of Aarhus, former member of the ICANN Board of Directors, uh, Directors and former Special Advisor to the Mundial Initiative. <clears throat> He'll be followed by uh, Mr. Jeff Moss, founder and creator of Black Hat and DEF CON, um, and Ms. Marija Schake, International Director of Policy at Stanford Cyber Policy Center, President of the Cyber Peace Institute and former member of the European Parliament. We will then conclude with comments from Ms. Henriette Esterhusen, chair of the IGF Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group and senior advisor of the Association of Progressive Communications. We will then go to our expert commentators um, for uh, additional comments on how the public core has been relevant for their work. Uh, with that, I would like to start uh, with uh, the video from Vint Cerf. Uh, can we please start with that video? Thank you. Vint Cerf, I'm Google's chief internet evangelist, and I really appreciate an opportunity to talk to you for a few minutes, not only about the public core of the internet and its protection, but more generally, uh, the concept of digital cooperation, which is something that the UN Secretary General uh, has been uh, strongly in favor of promoting, and, and, as am I. So let's talk a little bit about the internet. It has become a very important infrastructure for at least half the world, and it is, I think, uh, predictably going to become an important infrastructure for the other half, which is not yet connected. I think COVID-19 has certainly highlighted fractures and fissures uh, in our social and economic fabric, and some of those in some ways are very dependent on the availability and access to the internet. A lot of people, including me, have been able to work from home, for example, uh, because our, the nature of our jobs allows us to be virtually anywhere that we can find an internet connection of adequate capacity. That's not true for everyone. And it's vital to recognize that we have real disparity and inequity in terms of uh, the kind of work that people can do and the role that the internet plays in it. But to the extent that the internet has become and will become even more uh, central to our social and economic fabric, uh, it's vital that we come to a common agreement on a global uh, basis to protect the public core, by which uh, I mean the optical fiber networks and the underlying uh, you know, undersea and, and land-based fiber, uh, radio-based links, satellite links, which exist or are to come, uh, especially in, in, in contemplation of such systems as Starlink. 
Um, all of those things, the routers that, uh, that move packets around in the network, uh, the domain name system uh, and its uh, replicated root servers, um, uh, all of the resolvers that uh, map the domain names into IP addresses, and the institutions that are vital to uh, the Internet's health and, and continued evolution. So ICANN and the Internet Engineering Task Force and the Internet Society, all of these, uh, all of the um, regional Internet registries, these are all very important institutions uh, whose operation is critical to the successful um, functioning and expansion of the Internet. So we need to protect that in order to be uh, able to rely upon it. And I would argue that that's simply step number one. Step number two, of course, is to understand the way in which the Internet has affected our social and economic fabric. Uh, and we, I think, all would agree that its positive benefits have been strongly demonstrated in both economic and educational and entertainment and so on. But it also, unfortunately, as a sort of a neutral platform, is also a great megaphone for misinformation, disinformation, bullying, and all fraud, and all kinds of other abuse. So our challenge uh, as a community is to figure out how to preserve all the value of the internet while we are uh, inhibiting or at least mitigating some of the um, harmful behaviors that we see uh, in this system. And that's going to require uh, the adoption of norms, if not treaty-like practices, in order to cope with these problems. And the responses will vary, I think, from uh, country to country, culture to culture. Uh, the uh, mechanisms by which we achieve that objective and the choices uh, that we take uh, to put guardrails on uh, behaviors that we generally uh, agree are harmful to our society and to our uh, citizens. So I wish I could be there with you. Unfortunately, I cannot. Um, but I am uh, hoping that you will have a productive discussion and that you will be able to elicit important steps that we can take in order to assure that the Internet will remain a useful tool for us in the decades to come. In the, mean <clears throat> in the meantime, I hope I see you on the net. So there you go, um, Vince Cerf, everyone. Um, Vince was not a commissioner, but was at the title of, of advisor to the commission. And indeed, he was more active in our deliberations than some of our commissioners. So he was uh, a, definitely a valued member of our community when we deliberated uh, the public core norm. The public core norm itself is only part of a larger body of work that the Global Commission um, produced. So we're going to start first with a very brief overview of the GCSE uh, report, Advancing Cyber Stability, that Wolfgang uh, will do. And then we will move to um, uh, a further explanation of the public core norm and its application. So with that, let's start the uh, presentation. And Wolfgang, the floor is yours. OK, thank you very much, uh, and uh, Alexander, and welcome uh, from uh, rainy Germany. Uh, the, um, uh, it's the third presentation already for the uh, Global Commission at an IGF. I remember uh, Paris in 2018 and Berlin in 2019. And while uh, we uh, were on the road in uh, uh, Berlin and uh, uh, Ro uh, uh, Paris, we have now uh, finished our work and the final report is on the table. So uh, this was an exciting experience because the instrument of a commission, of a global commission, is really not new for international relations. And sometimes, you know, the uh, instrument of a commission is used when um, uh, governments are unable to agree. Because in this commission, you have uh, multi-stakeholder participation. So you get different perspectives and uh, you have a much broader a background then in poorly intergovernmental negotiations. And you know, the background for the, um, uh, this commission on stability in cyberspace was more or less the failure of the GTE in 2017. Say, uh, 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 reached, the GTE uh, reached an agreement in 2015 on a number of norms, uh, but how to implement the norms and to specify the norms. They could not reach agreement. And this was uh, the background where the commission was built, so we had membership, as you see on the slide, 
you know, from all over the world, uh, including uh, uh, North America, South America, China, Russia, uh, Asia, and uh, from various uh, European countries and a good representation from Africa. So it was supported by a number of governments, a number of private sector uh, members and academic uh, and uh, civil society and technical institutions. Um, and um, the um, uh, main aim was really to look uh, beyond the uh, uh, intergovernmental in negotiations to concentrate on the key issues where we identified that uh, the, the uh, stability of the internet is uh, a key for the future. And uh, the, uh, uh, as you have, uh, it is, was proved now by the COVID pandem uh, pandemic, uh, that uh, we, uh, from the very early day, realized that uh, the internet uh, infrastructure is, uh, or the access to the internet, is as important for billions of people as access to water, as the access to, to energy. And as we have seen in recent weeks, this is really true and it's not yet recognized by everybody. And in so far, if we have such an important infrastructure, then this has to be stable. In, uh, cyber stability is a key element now for the functioning of the whole system of international relations, uh, both on the intergovernmental level as also on the broader level. And as Winchester has said, you know, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Kuderich, has taken this idea one step further and said, you know, if we want to achieve stability, we need a new level of digital cooperation. And he offered, and which is really an interesting uh, proposal coming from the Secretary General of the United Nations, he offered the intergovernmental United Nations as a platform for a multi-stakeholder dialogue. And as you see here, you know, what, how we uh, uh, propose to uh, enhance cyber stability. Uh, we have uh, different instruments and uh, the multi-stakeholder engagement is certainly one of the most important. So uh, we have recognized like the 193 member states of the United Nations that international law is the basis uh, for all activities in cyberspace. So cyberspace is not a law free zone. So we have recognized the needs for technical standards and we are very thankful that ISOC and the IETF were strong partners of the commission. So we uh, developed a number of principles and norms, voluntary norms, where we discuss this more in detail a little bit later. And we uh, covered also the need for uh, confidence building and capacity building. And indeed, confidence was also at the core of our activities, uh, because if you um, use the internet as uh, a basic infrastructure for a lot of things which just mentioned, you know, for a uh, trade, for entertainment, for uh, uh, all kinds of business, the economy, the whole society uh, is dependent on it, then you need a certain basic level of trust and confidence. And that's why we have developed this uh, definition of uh, cyber stability. And we have uh, defined it in a more dynamic way because the internet, uh, which is different from other infrastructures, you know, is always open for new innovation, for also breaking uh, 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 innovations, uh, breakthroughs, which uh, offer new forms of um, uh, hardware, software, where you can do uh, new things. Remember that 25 years ago, when we had already the internet, there were just the first search engines, there were no social networks, no smartphone, uh, no smartphones and all this. This will happen in the future. Again, we will see new breakthroughs and in so far, we need a dynamic definition of cyber stability. All these new applications and services which will arrive the next 10 years, you know, need a stable basis so that people, uh, 4 billion people today, uh, 5 people, uh, mid billion people tomorrow, will um, use it in a, in a proper way. So um, the, uh, I think the, uh, uh, our approach has proved 
that to have a multi-stakeholder engagement, a thinking out of the box in a smaller group of experienced people from uh, various groups, former ministers, former CEOs, uh, uh, former leaders from civil society and others, uh, also uh, younger people, you know, make sense to bring them together and to produce something. So uh, in the 1980s, we had the Brandt and the Palme Commission, which produced concepts for global development and global disarmament. Uh, we had the Brundtland Commission uh, in the 1990s, which produced the concept of sustainable development. And our commission, which was led by the former foreign minister from Estonia, Marina Kaljurund, in the first phase, and then in the second phase by Lata Reddy from India and Michael Chardo from the US, also a former minister, uh, produced the concept of cyber stability. So we are looking forward, though it's a very dynamic process. So the, the principles, and in particular, the protection of the four principles is at the core of our proposals. But there is a life after the commission. And if we are look forward now, we're looking already towards 2025, where we have the WISIS Plus 20 review conference on the World Summit on the Information Society. We have the roadmap now from the Secretary General of the United Nations. So a lot of things have to do, but let's present now what we have achieved and how we will contribute to the process in the next five years. Back to you, Alex. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to fill in briefly, um, as uh, Wolfgang was saying, uh, part of our output was also uh, not only confidence building measures, but actually voluntary norms. You see on the screen right now, eight of the norms that the commission worked upon. We talked about these norms yesterday in some depth. So we won't go into them right now. Uh, indeed, today we are going to talk about our very first norm, the norm to protect the public core of the internet, or the first one that the commission agreed upon, even though we didn't invent this norm, uh, it was uh, first first considered by, um, in the Dutch context with by, an, by an academic experts in the Netherlands. And before that, it circulated in cyberspace policy circles for a number of years. We were happy to adopt it and uh, further refine it. And for that, I'd like to go to our next speaker, uh, Jeff Moss. Jeff, uh, take it on, please. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Jeff Moss. I'm gonna be talking briefly about attacking uh, the core and introducing the public core norm and why we think this was the, our most foundational and, and most important norm on which we built. So let me read to you on the next slide uh, the, the words the call to protect the public core of the internet. State and non-state actors should neither conduct nor knowingly allow activity that intentionally or substantially damages the general availability or integrity of the public core of the internet, and therefore the stability of cyberspace. And you see there's a little red star there. We're gonna define what we think of, the, of as the public core. So clearly there's a lot of moving pieces that make the internet function, but at the basis, uh, the foundation of them, there's several core technologies. And we spent a lot of time debating the strengths and weaknesses of adding or removing something from the list. And the consensus was uh, four key areas. So that would be packet routing and forwarding. So you might think of this in a technological standpoint as the border gateway protocol uh, routers. Uh, the naming and numbering systems, most people think of the global uh, DNS system, root name servers. Uh, the IANA functions, when you hear this, uh, the cryptographic mechanisms of security and identity, this would probably be uh, certificate authorities would be the first thing that would jump to mind. Whether you're getting a certificate authority for your home router or for Microsoft's content delivery um, to sign digital signatures on their, on their website. And finally, physical transmission uh, media. So Vint mentioned a little bit about uh, submarine cables, fiber cables. This would be the actual physical medium moving um, the packets around. And without any one of these things, the whole internet as a, uh, stops functioning as a whole. So we couldn't reduce it to a smaller set than this. And if you look at the next slide, we were trying to capture the interdependence of the core. And, uh, and I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some historical attacks against the core and some key characteristics of this core. And so first off, when you start thinking about the, the core, you realize um, 
it's no one is responsible for the core. No one company or government or person is in charge of it all. And so therefore we are all sort of responsible in our own way, in our own capacity. It's up to us to set these norms and to make sure the core continues to function because without it, nothing functions. And so some of the characteristics, the two critical characteristics, so I think um, you'll see is that the, the core is inherently shared or multi-tenant. Um, and this is, comes most into, into uh, relief when, for example, a router that's moving packets for say a political party could be moving packets for say a police department or a university. And if that router comes under attack and uh, is taken offline, it will uh, impact all of the tenants, all the people below it. Uh, and so there is the potential for a lot of collateral harm here. If you were attempting uh, to have say, uh, let's say a political sit-in and you wanted to take that political party offline, you unintentionally could be causing a lot of collateral harm. Um, it's also multi-jurisdictional. You don't get to control where your packets flow. And so therefore your packets might cross 10 different jurisdictions before it reaches your destination, even if your destination is just next door. And this infrastructure is largely privately owned and operated. Um, and when I was, uh, I was briefly the first chief security officer at ICANN, and when we were trying to come up with a way of describing um, the global name system, the root operators naming and numbering, we would always refer to this as a global good. Um, and so we would try to protect it. Uh, we would not try to say that it was critical infrastructure inherently inviting government into regulate because really it is a shared infrastructure and it's inherently dual purpose. So it can be used both in peacetime and in wartime. And the cores are relied on by everybody, I think, as Wolfgang mentioned, uh, you know, as a key economic uh, engine of, of innovation. So there's a lot at stake here. And with this next slide, I want to try to illustrate that the, in not just the interdependence, but some of the, the historical attacks that, that have happened targeting the core. Um, one that's not on the slide was one of the first ones, uh, March 31st, 2013, the group Anonymous announced that they were going to perform Operation Global Blackout, and they were going to attack all the root servers and take down the internet. And uh, this was one of the first times that such an intention was, was made out loud. And luckily they gave us a lot of notice uh, to prepare for the attack. And in the end, nothing really came of it, but it was the wake up call to a lot of owners and operators that the core could be targeted for political purposes, not just for say espionage. Okay. If you look at some of the other uh, attacks here, DNS espionage, um, the net nod attack, what you see here, there's, there's two buckets of these attacks. One is collateral harm due to the inherent multi-tenant nature. Somebody is attacking one part of the network and harming another. And the second type of attack are targeted attacks. Somebody is going after a specific provider. Um, they don't like Google, they're attacking just Google um, or uh, could be an inherently uh, an espionage function. Okay. They're trying to steal secrets from a provider and so those are the two types of issues that we had to face uh, as a commission coming up with norms. Um, and the one that causes the most harm most immediately to the most number of people is the collateral harm. And you can see those are the primarily the kind of attacks we're seeing here. Okay. So we don't believe that the attacks will um, decrease anytime soon. I think the pre prevalence the, uh, and the uh, uh, nature of the internet uh, growing ever larger, more people becoming uh, connected, will inherently lead to more disruptions, either intentional or accidental. And with this norm, what we, we hope to do is that by getting all the participants, by getting the international community to clearly state out loud that these behaviors, these types of targeted or collateral harm attacks are not acceptable, um, we wanna create an expectation of core stability and that uh, the core stability is, is critical step. And ideally we want to move at some point from a soft norm to more of a hard norm. And so that's why it's really important for all the stakeholders and everybody involved in, in this session to, to please embrace this uh, public norm and help us create a more uh, stable internet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for the overview of the public core and, and the threats to it. Um, uh, next, uh, 
Maritza Schake was instrumental in getting uh, our norm uh, adopted within the European Union. Um, and now in our, as a civil society and academic expert, we'll continue. Thank you so much. On and on issues related to the public court. Oh, sorry. Please, uh, and over to you, Maritza. I think you froze for a second, Alex. I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> but seeing everybody here online really makes me realize how much um, I miss being at the IGF in person and working with you in you know, round table settings and in informal chats by the coffee machine. But uh, I hope everybody's staying well in these challenging times and on this historic day uh, for democracy as well. Um, so after all the reflections on the technical aspects and the risk and the need to preserve the public core, I wanted to say a few words on the political support and the uh, global support that we've observed so far and that we're uh, happy to see. Uh, of course, this is a work in progress and we need to continue to uh, build support and actual implementation of protecting the public core. But I think the support really reflects an appreciation for the need to preserve the space of mutual dependence and mutual trust uh, that we sought to reflect in our norm on the public core. And I personally see this as increasingly important also to counterbalance not only the risks that uh, Jeff and Vince have reflected on, um, but also the massive role for the private sector in governing cyberspace. There's a need to focus more on the public interest as well. So um, I'll mention a few highlights of the uh, uptake of the norm by government's multi-stakeholder efforts. Uh, beginning with uh, a quote from the foreign minister, Steph Bloch, that he um, shared in a speech one year ago, uh, almost this week at the Paris Peace Forum, in which he said, there should be no tampering with the public core of the internet. Internet infrastructure should be regarded as the backbone of modern society. Undersea cables and other vital elements should be off limits. And he meant off limits for attackers. Uh, and he said those words in response to the presentation of our report, uh, which is, uh, I suppose, a year old uh, as well. Then uh, the uh, uh, recent UN roadmap for digital cooperation speaks of digital public goods and promoting digital public goods to create a more equitable world. Uh, it says we must undertake a concerted global effort to encourage and invest in the creation of digital public goods open source software, open data, open AI models, open standards and open content. These digital public goods should adhere to privacy and other applicable laws and best practices, do no harm and help attain the sustainable development goals. Then there was the Paris Peace Call, a multi-stakeholder appeal that also uh, mentions to prevent activity that intentionally and substantially damages the general availability or integrity of the public core of the internet. And as Alex already uh, alluded to, the EU Cybersecurity Act, which was adopted in March of 2019 and forms part of a larger effort uh, of uh, EU wide cybersecurity laws put in place. Um, beyond establishing an EU cybersecurity certification framework and promoting uh, ANISA, an EU agency for network and information security. The Cybersecurity Act includes a clear commitment to protect the public core of the internet, which we put in uh, to the text from the European Parliament side. Um, it states that the public core of the internet is a global public good and underpins the normal operation of the internet as a whole. Um, the new law tasks ANISA with assisting member states with policies that sustain the general availability and integrity of the public core of the open internet. So uh, I want to keep it short so that we may have some time for Q&A. That's usually the most exciting. So uh, thank you for, for this. And it's, it's great for all of us to see that this is a, a lively discussion with more progress being made. And we invite others who feel that there is relevance in the context of their work to continue to push this norm forward. Thank you. Thank you, Marietje. And thank you for keeping to the allocated, allocated time um, as a true professional can appreciate how important it is that we're able to get questions in at the end um, that makes it possible. So next, Henriette Estruzen, please, um, on the next steps regarding the public core norm and its implementation. Um, Henriette, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, um, Alex. Um, I think 
you know, what, what really needs to happen now is that we need to advance this norm. I think you've heard about this norm, why it's important, and also the progress that has been made in, in having it written into legislation, for example. And, and the proposals in the report, the, the GCSC report, really aims to complement this work. And we want to take this work forward through advocacy, implementation, and adherence there is a need to further define the concept and the end goal of the public core. And I think we've, 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 we, we realize that in um, the process of talking to people about it. We want to build on the definition of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace that includes currently packet routing and forwarding, naming and numbering systems, the cryptographic mechanisms of security and identity and transmission media. Um, part of this is to examine what contributions civil society and more specifically the internet governance community, community can make towards defining monitoring and protecting the public core of the internet. In other words, we don't see the public core um, as a, a static notion that just involves um, naming and numbering, for example. We see this core as something that has to be defined and understood by different communities from their perspective. So building on the GCSC recommendation to establish and support communities of interest to implement those norms, we need to look beyond like-minded coalitions of states and include civil society in the private sector. And that is what's so unique about the GCSC as opposed to the governmental expert norms, for example. We multi-stakeholder communities and different stakeholders request to get them to, to uphold and promote these norms. And many of the defenders come from the private sector and from civil society. And so implementation of this norm depends on their support and also of whether other actors are upholding this, this norm to protect the public core. And one example of, of this happening is through the Paris call. Um, community of interest, which has been established by the Hague Center to further refine the concept of the public core in the same way that Microsoft has done with um, the notion of election security, for example, exploring it, understanding it and defining it um, in, a, in a deeper way. And this Paris call community will seek to find ways to advance the implementation and monitoring of the principle as well as related norms that, that, that links to the, the public core norm. Finally, um, and I think this is reflected in the chat already, norms gain strength through active enforcement. When they are enforced by a community of interest, the state and non-state actors involved are better placed to isolate and call out malicious actors, stigmatize particular forms of behavior, and mobilize support to impose cost transgressors. And in that sense, this, uh, this discussion taking place in the IGF, the fact that we are calling on, on stakeholders involved in the Internet Governance Forum to be part of this process is extremely important because you, you represent such a diverse group of actors from so many different parts of the world. So getting your buy-in and your engagement um, in this process of protecting the public core is in fact, I think, um, the vital ingredient, ingredient that we need to take our work for, further at this point. Thanks, Alex, back to you. Thank you, Henriette. <clears throat> and uh, as you correctly said, there is a number of interesting points being raised in the Q&A box. Um, please add your, your ideas and your questions there so they can be upvoted because uh, that will provide us a method for distinguishing which questions we're going to tackle um, when we go to Q&A. Uh, I'd like to go next to our uh, external experts, although external wouldn't be the correct term since all of them have been involved in the work of the Global Commission to various degrees. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Natalie Jarosma, who is Ambassador at Large for Security Policy and Cyber from the Netherlands. Um, the, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands was one of the first backers of the Global Commission on Stability for Cyberspace and indeed has backed the notion of the public core before the existence of the GCSC. So we're very welcome. We're very glad that you could join us today. Um, and uh, we look forward to your, to your thoughts. Thank you, uh, Alex, for uh, giving me the floor. And uh, fellow experts and GCSC commissioners for your views on the public core. 
Um, as has been mentioned just now, the public core norm has been introduced into many fora, such as the Paris call via the EU Cybersecurity Act, and also the UN discussions within the framework of the first committee. And I would like to shortly uh, share with you the uh, perspective of the Netherlands on the advancements of the public core norm and our efforts within the UN so far. Our minister has committed the Netherlands to endeavor to protect the general availability and integrity of the public core of the internet. And the Netherlands has done so since its international cyber strategy of 2017 and put forward its efforts in UN discussions ever since. And next to an international agenda, the Netherlands also sought to implement these recommendations on a national level. In the Netherlands, the availability of the internet is considered as a vital process, underlining the importance of this infrastructure. It is in our belief that economic and social advantages of the use of the internet are dependent on a trustworthy, predictable, stable, and safe functioning of core protocols and infrastructure of the internet. Protecting the public core is an issue of global concern, extending beyond the narrow considerations of national security. Cyber operations by state or non-state actors could negatively affect the functioning of the public core of the internet and thus global availability of the whole internet. It is hard to imagine how we could cope with a crisis like this pandemic without the amenities that the internet provides us. For the further development and preservation of the public core, states should lean on the technical community and adopt a more supporting role. We can do so by the creation of a normative framework. Within the UN First Committee, two working groups, the open-ended working group and the group of governmental experts are currently discussing a normative framework on the responsible behavior of states in cyberspace. The Netherlands has pr promoted to protect the public core as part of the recommendations for implementation of the consensus acquis. It is through these kinds of innovations that the GG and OEWG address the urgent concerns of the international community. Thanks to tremendous work of the Global Commission, there is growing support for this idea. Up to 75 states have supported the public core in the context of the OEWG or other initiatives. It has been mentioned in the pre-draft report of the OEWG. Also within the GG, it remains a topic put high on the agenda by the Dutch expert. There have been some sensitivities on the concept as it has been perceived by some as government related. And it is actually quite the opposite. It is a norm of restraint. States should refrain from doing things that may damage the public core. The public, so does not relate to public versus private, in which case it would be, be government related, but it comes from the conceptualization of the public core as a global public good. And this was done by the WRR, the Netherlands Scientific Council for Government Policy. It implies the protection of a common good and does not have a government related influence. By capturing the protection of the public core within a normative framework that is shared across UN member states, it is possible to challenge those threatening it, threatening it and safeguard a stable cybersecurity. Cyberspace, sorry. Thanks, Alex. Back to you. Thank you very much, Natalie. <clears throat> uh, next, I'd like to, to, to go to uh, Dr. Sergei Droz, Chair of the Forum of Incident Responders and Security Teams. Most of you will know what FIRST is, but for those of you who don't, they sometimes are introduced as the Union of CERTs, CERTs as in Computer Emergency Response Teams, um, the firefighters of the internet. Um, so definitely a representative of the technical community and we look forward to your thoughts. Thank you, Alexander. So as you said, I represent the technical community and in particular, I represent the community of incident handlers. We are often compared to, uh, to the firefighters of the internet. So what does that mean? It means that if an attack is happening, uh, we are the ones that usually are the first ones to be on the scene. And one of our most important tools that we need to work on, obviously, is the internet. You cannot do instance response in the internet in a global infrastructure without being able to talk to other participants, to other security teams around the world. So 
in the Q&A, there's a question about kind of physical analogous to, uh, to norms that help protecting this and help prevent collateral damage. And I would argue one of them is actually being during a war time, the medical system, the health system, the ambulances. And when we commit to protecting the core of the internet, we also should commit to protecting actually the people that, that protect the core, that do the emergency response. Uh, and this is something that's quite often forgotten. So if, if you start attacking kind of the firefighters, you're gonna have a hard time fighting the fires. And so I guess what that really means or what I'm saying is if, you, if you're protecting an infrastructure, you also need to protect the people that use the infrastructure. And obviously coming from an instance response community, those are the instance responders. But then again, if you only happen to have people to protect the infrastructure, it's kind of boring. So I would really say that the internet is what it is because it has civil society living on it. It has uh, all the actors on it. And if you start attacking these, uh, the norm actually gets a lot bigger. And, and so we often talk about what is the collateral damage. And I think this is kind of a feedback loop. If you, if you start shutting out a lot of the stuff that's not in the narrow sense part of the critical infrastructure, you're actually going to do damage to the infrastructure itself at the end. So that's really what I'd like to say right in the beginning. And back to you, Alex. Thanks. Thank you very much, Serge, and thank you for drawing attention to the importance of also protecting the open standard setting processes, as well as the individuals that are key for maintaining the core. Um, actually, one part of our document for the of the public core of the internet is that the open standards process, such as the Internet Engineering Task Force and similar, are also part of the public core. So, um, but, but what you've also addressed is actually partially covered by a norm, uh, one of the 11 norms the UN Group of Governmental Experts uh, put out protecting the computer emergency response teams from interference. Um, but the question always then is, uh, is then uh, are more norms that are similar to each other a reinforcement of these norms or do they conflict with each other? Um, and perhaps to help us understand how these different processes work side by side, we can go to our next speaker, um, Shital, Ms. Shital Kumar, uh, Senior Program Lead, Global Partners Digital. Shital has been uh, very much part of the, the process within the open-ended working group and helped lead the charge from the civil society side. And so has a very good in level of insight as to how these processes uh, work together or sometimes conflict. So Shital, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Alex. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this important discussion. It's great to see you all online um, and I'm hoping everyone has a, a really excellent IGF um, this year. So for those of you who don't know Global Partners Digital, we're an organization, a human rights organization working to uh, towards an internet, um, working to promote an internet underpinned by human rights and democratic values. And so this norm is, is obviously particularly um, irrelevant and I can only offer one civil society perspective, um, of course, but I think what is really important and, and interesting and essential about the public core norm is that it recognizes or it has as its premise, I, I suppose, that there are many parts of the internet which are transborder um, and there are there are those which are territorial but where harmed um, have transborder or collateral impacts and so the internet is a public good um, with these characteristics of universality and interoperability and accessibility that need to be preserved these characteristics and I would actually say that a lot of people without necessarily perhaps realizing it simply expect those characteristics to be preserved because that's their experience of the internet. And that's very important, um, I think, as well as, as we promote, uh, promote this norm and those characteristics. So the idea of governing the internet in the public interest as a public good is something I think a lot of civil society groups are working towards. Um, and as I said, I can't speak for all. And civil society is a very diverse, um, incorporates a very diverse range of groups. But I think generally this idea of working towards a collective interest and protecting the internet as a public good uh, are um, 
is, is what many civil society groups are working towards. And, and that's uh, unfortunately a framing which does clash with another framing of governing the internet uh, in the, from a national security perspective and seeing unfortunately the internet or cyberspace as a playground or, or even worse, you know, battleground uh, for national uh, political interests. And in a lot of groups, um, now recognize that this and, and stakeholders and states recognize that this is uh, a framing um, which leads to actions, which leads to tensions and which leads to issues that, that damage the internet from a collective interest perspective. Uh, so a lot of work is being done in that regard. And, um, and I think you know, colleagues have mentioned other processes, the open-ended working group, et cetera, which I'll come to. But I think also at the infrastructural uh, layers, the logical and physical layers of the internet, which have been mentioned, the protocols, et cetera, there's a lot of work that's been done uh, by groups and um, uh, by colleagues on applying the human rights framework to, um, to those layers and the relevance and also the challenges of applying them you know, in, in relevant institutions. So um, one particular publication, recent publication comes to mind there. I think that it's a Stanford Center of Philanthropy and Civil Society that has put together a compendium of work uh, of those who have been working to, to understand the inter, the, the linkages between uh, those layers and, and the human rights framework and, and the public interest in general. And then another aspect of the public core norm, which I wanted to highlight, uh, is around the cryptographic mechanisms of security and identity, which are uh, quite clearly highlighted in the norm and identified. And how essential uh, that is, cryptography is, to protecting the stability and security of the internet, um, the public core. And unfortunately, you know, there, there are continuing attempts to undermine encryption in various ways. They're not all the same. They're not equally perhaps damaging to the public core, but there are, there are attempts. And a number of, of groups uh, of, over the past year through the Global Encryption Coalition, which GPD is part of, uh, have got together. It includes actually um, companies as well. Uh, but we're all united in our commitment to promoting and protecting strong encryption. So I do, uh, I, I would encourage you to come to our open forum on Friday. Uh, look for it in the IGF schedule where we'll be um, telling uh, the IGF community a bit more about, about the, um, the, the Global Encryption Coalition. But just that to say that there's, there's a lot of work going on there to ensure that cryptographic mechanisms are protected and, and as a public core norm identifies, it's really important to do so. So just quickly, uh, one final thing, um, which I think is important to extract from the public core norm, which is of uh, deep relevance to civil society, is that it's very clear from the norm uh, that there are a very wide range of actors involved in ensuring um, that that the internet is interoperable, accessible, open, and that it is governed in the, in the collective interest. And that's very important, um, that multi-stakeholder approach, I think for a lot of civil society groups working in this space. And, uh, and it's something that um, a number of us have been promoting in the open-ended working group. Uh, we recently submitted some joint feedback on the implementation of, of the GGE norms from a human-centric point of view because a lot of discussion has been happening in the open-ended working group uh, around how to implement the existing norms. So um, again, I would encourage um, people to look at that because it, it's another attempt to ensure this, um, this, this governance happens multi-stakeholder way. Uh, and then finally, because um, I know that we have some time for questions, which is great, Civil society has an important role to play in ensuring accountability and ensuring adherence to norms. And where state interventions or interventions by others uh, damage um, or, or harm the public core, you know, we have to turn to research, independent research, in order to ensure trust and in order to ensure um, accountability and reasons really to adhere to, mm -hmm. to these norms. And that's where civil society also plays a role. So I do, like I'm, you know, turning back to what I said at the beginning, I do have uh, hope um, for, for the, um, the future and the implementation of this norm, particularly because I think 
people have expectations of the internet as something interoperable, open and accessible. And that's what this norm, you know, governing the collective interest. And that's what this norm aims to do. Um, so I'll leave it there for now. And thanks again for having me. Okay, okay great. Thank you very much, Sheetal. And as you, point, as you say, uh, we have some minutes left for questions, luckily enough. Um, and thank you for those who put uh, their questions into the Q&A app, which gives us the option to upvote and um, particularly interesting questions. So I'd like to pose one question to the joint panel, meaning GCSE speakers and uh, uh, expert briefers. Um, that is a composite question um, from Paul Wilson, plus an additional uh, person uh, um, who the question was effectively, what are the best analogs in the non-digital space to the protection of the public core? So what historical examples are there for something similar, be it a global public good or a global public resource? Um, what can we learn from that example? And then a related question would be, um, do we need a treaty to help protect that? So um, the floor is open for comments from both of uh, the panelists. Uh, please uh, raise your hand so I can see you if you and call on you rather than everybody speaking at the same time. So first, Jeff. And then uh, we'll yeah, I would say that the closest analogy I can think of are basically shared utilities, common reliance upon water infrastructure, electrical infrastructure, telephone infrastructure, um, which, you know, we're essentially monopolies. So it's not the best analogy, but it's probably the closest we have in a, in a fiscal sense. OK, um, other panelists like to pick this up. Wolfgang, please. Uh, you could compare it also, you know, with the uh, high sea or the outer space, uh, which is different. So that means there is no direct analogy, uh, but this is in the common interest of mankind. And it's related to the concept of the common interest of mankind, where every country, regardless of its ideology, economic interests, strengths or whatsoever, you know, has to be an interest to keep it safe, free and open. Yes, thank you, Wolfgang, for drawing attention to the uh, common heritage of mankind or common interest of mankind principle that was first defined within UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, and we continued on in the Outer Space Treaty, uh, Moon Treaty, and Arctic Treaty. Um, it's indeed very often been quoted as a potential option um, to uh, for the public core. The question, however, the next question would be, do we need a treaty, however, to safeguard it? Is it possible to do it with a different instrument? Um, and our treaty is the most effective instrument. One of the arguments has been, for instance, at the Antarctic Treaty, or for instance, the treaty for the seabed um, uh, agreement as part of UNCLOS only were, were adhered to as long as governments did not have an interest in exploiting them. So as soon as there was an interest in exploiting those resources are violating the territorial integrity of Antarctica, those treaties were violated. So there is a question if treaties work, even though they've been the, the instrument so far. Do any of the panelists want to pick up on this question? I know quite a few of our panelists have talked about this in private, so please feel free. Well, I think when we talk about norms or when I talk to norms about, about norms to my friends, especially in the technical community, I always get this, but they're voluntary, no one sticks to them, so they're gonna be ignored. And I mean, the same is true for laws. We have speeding laws. Uh, that doesn't mean people don't speed. It just makes the price higher. And if we, if we manage to get actually an international binding treaty that, that makes attacks on the core illegal, it just puts up the price for any attacker or any nation state attacker to actually do this. And I think that's the whole goal. We should we should really get away from this notion if there is a law, it's not gonna happen thing. I mean, spam is illegal. Look into your spam folder. It doesn't stop spam, but it, it reduces it. And I think that's the whole goal. Uh, thank you, Jeff. You had a comment? Yeah, my only concern on the treaty, well, I have a several, but one of them is that the, the nature of the internet is, is largely commercial and private owner operators, civil society. And if you move the protection mechanisms out of the hands of the owners operators and into the hands of government treaty organizations, you're distancing the, the rules from the people who actually operate the levers and knobs. And, and I would be concerned about that. Like you might actually create a, a different incentive structure uh, 
uh, from the people who are actually currently operating and owning the networks. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for that. I want to move on to two further questions since we have quite a few um, that are a bit more technical. So probably going to be more for Anuriet, Jeff, and Wolfgang, but please all feel free to comment. Uh, we have a question from Vladimir Radunovich about uh, new discussions. How discussions on new IP plus impacting the public core through standards and governance fall under this norm, or is it rather about cyber attacks narrowly? And another question from Monica Ermet is how to avoid that in the upcoming IGF plus process and perhaps intergovernmental work, the wheel is reinvented again, instead of building upon what you have, what we have done in our recommendations and what of course we ourselves have built upon, uh, the entire discussion just restarts and we lose more time. Um, who would like to pick that up? Wolfgang first. Wolfgang, you're muted. Uh, you're muted. Yes. Yes, uh, yeah, to Monica's question, you know, uh, there is also an option paper uh, uh, with regard to the roadmap and the high level panel uh, for recommendation 5A and B, which introduces an interesting uh, mechanism how to link the intergovernmental negotiation system to the multi stakeholder discussion platform by introducing liaisons. So that means all the uh, ideas which come out from the IGF should be channeled in a certain way to the uh, intergovernmental negotiation process to avoid the reinvention of the wheel. Because what we have seen in the last 10 years is that indeed, you know, if governmental negotiators are uh, disconnected from the multi-stakeholder discussion, then they tend to reinvent the wheel or to ignore uh, perspectives which are coming, you know, from other stakeholders and produce uh, outcomes, you know, which either do not work or get not the acceptance by the broader public. So I think the uh, proposal made by the two co-champions, the UAE and the German government, uh, are very useful. Uh, the challenge is now to implement it, and to translate this into very concrete actions. Uh, this is the way forward, and I hope that this, uh, this IGF 2020 will take a step forward, because this is the way uh, how we can move forward. And to Vladimir's question about the new IP, you know, the good thing with, we, with the internet so far is it wasn't based on open standards. It means you could add one layer and another layer and another application. So it was open for innovation. So uh, certainly if you come with, disrupt with disruptive proposal, which would undermine the existing system, this would have also consequences for the stability. So uh, the discussion about new IP is a little bit very speculative. The paper is called 2030 and beyond. So it's 10 years from now, nobody knows what will be in the future. So I can only challenge, you know, the technical community and others, you know, to come with great ideas. We need uh, innovation. Uh, uh, you know, we know from Schumpeter that uh, always, you know, creativity leads to destruction. So, uh, and, and this can be very positive. So that means we should not be afraid uh, to look ahead, but uh, we should be very careful that, uh, let's say, new proposals do not uh, uh, support the instability of the cyberspace, that, because this would have consequences for the economy, for the whole global system. Back to you, Alex. Thank you. Um, Anriet, did I, did I see you wishing to come? No. Oh. So the, I think the, the, the point on how to, how to avoid from Monica Ermert that the upcoming IGF plus process, um, and all the good work that one hopes will take place there, as well as the work that is taking place in other fora, such as the UN first committee, open the working group TGE, as well as the UN secretary general's high level panel on digital cooperation. Um, that they could be engaging in similar work that might constitute what Monica Ermit refers to as reinventing the wheel. But the question then to all panelists, uh, if we come up with similar norms, and we could argue that the public core norm is itself just a further development of an existing norm, is that reinventing the wheel or is that a reinforcement? Do, you, do the panelists think that if we come up with similar solutions, um, and similar problems at similar solutions that we are further addressing the issue or are we confusing the issue? Are we advancing towards a solution or are we muddling the 
um, Alex, I can respond. That would be the that. question for um, for. Right, please. Oh, I, I can respond a little bit to that, but I also want to respond to Monica's question. Well, I think that reinforces it. And I think, Monica, it's really good that you are asking that question, because I think we, as we evolve uh, digital cooperation architecture and evolve the IGF, I think it's very important that we don't lose this bottom-up quality of the IGF. Some people feel that the weaknesses of the IGF at the moment is that there's not enough high-level buy-in that there's not enough high level uptake of what emerges from the IGF. Um, but in fact, I think the GCSC and this norm demonstrates how the IGF is a sandbox and a public participation platform um, to brainstorm, to, to socialize these ideas. And then they are taken up by legislators. We've seen that. Um, so I think whatever happens with the evolution of the IGF, the will should not be reinvented. It should be strengthened and the links with high level institutions or decision making platforms need to be made stronger and more tangible. But I think this basic quality of the IGF as the very open and diverse space of deliberation should not be lost. Thank you, Henriette. Any further comments on, on that particular issue of reinforcement or muddling the, mo muddling the waters? Uh, otherwise, I want to, in the similar vein, Shital, did you have a comment? I, I wanted to uh, to say that I, I sit as well with Anriette in the view that there needs to be more communication between different um, uh, stakeholders and communities and constituencies to identify from a, in a bottom-up way where there are commonalities and that it's not a bad thing to have um, these uh, professions of what, what should be what behavior should be, what behavior should be restrained from. I think that's positive to have more people in the discussion, but we do need to identify where there are commonalities um, in order to advance uh, norms. And, and that's something that I think is happening, which is great. And, and I put in the, in the chat um, an example of efforts like that, which the best practice forum on cybersecurity of the IGF is doing, identifying commonalities between different norms agreements, uh, both multi-stakeholder and, and state-led. And, and I think that that's helpful because it's important to continue to socialize the efforts that are out there, but also move forward towards implementation um, by identifying commonalities. So yeah, so I just wanted to add that. Thanks so much, Alex. Thank you, Sheetal. Um, and furthering in the same vein, not only are there top and bottom up initiatives, there are also very much top down initiatives. Um, about a month and a half ago to pick up on a question we have in chat from Michael Nelson. Um, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has proposed a clean network initiative in order to keep the core of the internet secure and less subject to espionage. I don't know if it was to keep it less subject to espionage, but that's definitely, but but uh, definitely keeping internet secure is definitely um, part of the, the mission statement. At the same time, just like a couple of weeks ago, um, China announced an initiative to develop international standards for data security. So. We now have two similar, although very, very although perhaps also very different um, proposals by major powers um, on addressing aspects of what some might consider the public core. Um, would any panelists uh, like to comment on that? So Maricha and then sure. Sarah, please. Yeah, I, I think what we're seeing now is in the absence of articulating proactively what an enabling, safe, secure, trustworthy public environment would be, we see this sort of tit for tat reactions back and forth, which, you know, are, are unmistakably politically motivated. And I think that what we're trying to do is, is to really move beyond uh, the politics and to truly find where a mutual trust can be built and where mutual dependence should foster cooperation despite differences in political agendas. And so uh, this is where uh, I think we also have a sense of urgency to ensure that this more enabling trust building environment is built before there's more entrenchment and more protectionist nationalist and, uh, um, well, uh, contrarian kinds of models presented and adopted. Uh, thank you, Marietje. Serge and then Wolfgang, please. Yes, yeah, so I think these proposals of, of securing the internet 
they always tend to go in a direction I personally don't really like. There, there's always two ways on how you can create a safe environment. Like if you take a highway, you can just close the highway off. Eh? No cars, there's not going to be any accidents. Nothing is going to happen. At the same time, it's going to be a pretty boring place. So the other way to do this is actually you make sure that people behave so that it's a common good. You want to be able to kind of walk in a park. You want to be able to drive on a highway. And I think the, the proposal that the US has put forward of making the internet safe is, is more about locking it up and kind of erecting more borders, creating another big national firewall. And I think that is going to stifling the success of the internet. The internet is successful because everybody can participate. And I think that is what we should promote. I'm not really interested in a second fixed line network. I mean, doing a phone call is kind of great, but that's about the only thing you can do there. Uh, thank you, Sergi. I saw Wolfgang. I don't know, Jeff, if you wanted to make a comment or not to shake your head if that wasn't the case, but Wolfgang, you're next. Yes, I think also I, I agree with uh, the internet is not a fortress. So, and uh, while it needs protection, it needs stability. Uh, and, you know, if we make this a battlefield, the risk is indeed in a, uh, uh, that uh, the internet bifurcation, as some people have called this now, is on the horizon, which is bad. In an interdependent world, I think the UN panel has described the, uh, the uh, uh, situation where we, uh, where we are today as the age of cyber interdependence. And this panel was chaired by um, a Chinese man and an American woman. And they agreed that we are in an interdependent world. That means to decouple now the world and the world economy would have uh, would seen no winners. This would be a lose-lose game, and uh, this is senseless. So let's look forward and let's bring all partners uh, back to the rule of law. And I think this is where the European Union stands for. And in so far, we are looking not from a European perspective for a European internet. Uh, we are fighter for the open and free internet and try to bring others which have left the, the way of the rule of law and bring it back to the original values and uh, keep them in the global open, free, interoperable, unfragmented internet. Thank you. Back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Wolfgang. Jeff, did I see that you wanted a, a final comment? Final comment? Yeah, just that I'll second all the comments on uh, the interdependence. And I think what happens is the network operators, you know, they're the closest to the knobs and the levers, and the government um, is further away. And I think for a truly successful partnership, both need to sort of acknowledge their role mm -hmm. and strengthen their their ties to each other. So the technical people can count on the governmental uh, partners to fulfill their role. And the government can count on the technical community to do their role in an, you know, in an impartial and, and technically accurate way. And, and unless those two communities or three um, can, can come to some sort of working relationship, I think tension in one community will spill over into tension in another. Um, and and I, I don't wanna see that happen. Um, and so I would really like to see uh, people in the UN community acknowledge their role, but also encourage people outside in the technical community to, to live up to their uh, potential. And, and that's, I, I think that's really what we're calling out here is it's, it's a larger problem than any one person. And, you know, internet problems are global problems and they're going to need global solutions. And because of that, no one country is going to be able to force their way. No one country is going to get their rules. And I think we need a, a system that acknowledges that and rewards it. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, thank you, everyone. That's uh, all the time we have today. We could definitely continue this discussion um, for, for quite a while longer, but we are limited um, by also the, the wish to attend all the other great panels that are going on. If you want to be more involved in the public court discussion, it was briefly alluded to, that the Hague Center for Strategic Studies maintains the so-called community of interest um, at, that is part of the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace. Recommendation two of the Paris call directly addressed the need to protect the public core of the internet and HSS as the body that instituted the Global Commission Stability for Cyberspace is continuing to maintain a community of interest dedicated to the public core. So if you're interested in continuing continue this discussion, 
please get in touch with us directly. In the meantime, my thanks to the uh, Global Commission Stability Cyberspace Commissioners. Um, thank you, um, especially to our guest briefers for providing their, their outside comments. And most especially, thank you for the audience for a very interesting conversation and for contributing to it in the chat function and online. And uh, let's keep the discussion going. Uh, have a great idea. Thank you. Bye-bye.